And, and I tell you what, I'm probably the world's worst about forgetting things, I want to tell you, and maybe you are as well. I don't think it has anything to do with age, you guys. I just turned 39 not too long ago, so I'm sure that's not the, whole, that's not the problem. At, yeah, that's right, that's not the problem at all. But I tell you what, sometimes we have a tendency as fallen human beings to sometimes absolutely forget things that we really ought to be remembering, especially those foundational, bedrock, spiritual truths that guide us. We forget those, let me tell you what, we're in trouble. We forget those, we're in a bad, bad way. And that's why the opening thought, if you're going to summarize it, Peter's opening thought in the opening verses of the book of 1 Peter, here's what his byline is, always remember. Put that another way, never forget. Always remember, never forget certain things. If you forget those things, you're going to be in a bad way. Because actually, folks, we, every decision we make is based upon our perspective. And perspective is determined by where you stand. And where do we stand, y'all? We stand at the mouth of an empty tomb. And that has forever changed life. And it's changed the way we look at things. It's changed the way that we do things. Now, Peter's writing this. And we're looking at the book of 1 Peter. Because last Sunday, we began a series in the book of 1 Peter, it's kind of a series within the series. We're wired for connection, right? And all this year, we've been talking about being wired, talked about different aspects of that. The book of 1 Peter summarizes all of it. And in the opening introductory verses, and I'm calling that the first nine verses of the book, he says, let me tell you what, there's some things you must always remember and never, ever forget. See, this conversation came about, this book came about because some people in Asia Minor, it's modern day Turkey, began to look to the West every morning when they got up. Let me just review a little bit from last week. They began to look to the West, 1,347 and two-tenths miles away to Rome, Italy, where Nero had dropped a pebble in the pond. And when you drop a pebble in the pond, it ripples across, doesn't it? It just impacts the entire pond. It ripples and spreads out, spreads out. Well, he dropped a pebble in the pond, and it was persecution. The very first Christian persecution in Christian history, that is, empire-wide kind of persecution. And these folks over in Turkey were seeing it coming. It was coming closer and closer and closer. And they were wondering, how do we live? How do we survive how is it that we're supposed to walk this line how are we supposed to be God's people when we're living in an environment that's a little bit hostile maybe a lot hostile Nero's persecution was not the worst persecution but it was one it was pretty intense to be sure and they're wondering how do we how do we walk that line Peter picks up a pen and he begins to write and actually to really appreciate what Peter writes here you got to go all the way back to the beginning of this book and the beginning of the book is not first Peter chapter 1 verse 1 you got to go back 35 years earlier to a conversation that Peter and Jesus had in Mark chapter 8. It was the very first of the beginning of the end conversations. Remember we talked about that last week. Where Jesus begins to say, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die at the hands of the religious establishment. And Peter took him aside and said, that's not going to happen to you. And Jesus looks at him and says, you little devil. You are not putting your mind on the things of God. You're putting your mind on the things of men. And that really is the choices that we have. I mean, that's what it is. Life is a matter of the things of God and the things of men. And you and I are here trying to figure out how we walk between those, how we do the kinds of things and, and, and believe the kinds of things and hold on to the kinds of things that are of the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of culture or the kingdom of society or, or, or whatever that might be. Well, Jesus begins then, pulls the whole crowd in, and he says, Look, y'all, here's what life is. It can be difficult, and you've got to make choices and you have to be sure that you are doing the kinds of things that represent the kingdom of God. And as he explained all of that in Mark chapter 8, we're not going to go back in the kind of detail we did last week. But as he explains all that, he's laying something out for us. And he's telling us, folks, that where our hearts are tested is not in here. Where we're really measured is not by what we do in here or how we do this in here or how really. No, no. It's how we live out there. It's what we do out there. That's the playing field that we're doing. That's where hearts are tested. All of that in his mind, 35, year, 30, 35 years or so go by, he picks up his pen and he writes this letter to these folks up in Asia Minor that are facing a pretty hostile environment. Here's how he begins his book, first nine verses. He says, always remember, never forget Never forget. He talks about several things. Here's the first thing. Still reviewing from last week, right? I mean, any of you guys can get up here and review us, right? I'm just doing that, right? Somebody else could do this, couldn't they? Right? Do you remember it? What did he say? Always remember what? 
who you are. Never forget who you are. Every decision we face in life, every difficulty we may face, whatever the temptation might be, never forget who you are. And he describes us in verses 1 and 2 a couple of ways. The first thing he says about us is, is that we're strangers in this land. And his point in all that is, y'all, we don't belong here. It's not that we're just a little bit different. We believe in Jesus and we go to church on Sunday. The deal is at core value. At our hearts, at the very core of our beings, we're different. The way of the kingdom, the things of God are different from the things of this world. And he says, remember, you're a stranger here. He goes on to talk about that throughout the book. In fact, in chapter 2 and verse 11, he says, we're not only strangers, we're aliens here. You don't belong. This world is... Not our home, right? But he says that's not the end of the story. Not while we're strangers here, he says we're also what? God's elect. This is the first two verses of 1 Peter chapter 1. We're God's elect. We are God's chosen. We've been chosen, y'all, by the foreknowledge of God. We have been chosen by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Who's your daddy? Whatever it is that you face, never forget who you belong to. Who your family is. We're strangers here. We don't belong here. But we belong to him. Right? So that's the first thing that he talked about. Then he said, I don't want you to ever forget. Always remember, never forget what you're here for. And that's verse 2. Two things. We're here to, to, we're here to obey Jesus. And we're here to be holy. Whatever it is the world may say. Whatever it is the other opposing views may be. Here's, here's bottom line. It's really not that hard. We're going to obey Jesus. And we're going to be a holy people. And at first glance it may seem like those things kind of go together. Well they do go together. But Peter develops that as the book goes on. He develops those things independently. What holiness is and what being obedient to Jesus is. And I want you to know one thing. Just kind of as a preview to all of that. When he says to be holy. He's not talking about being religious. He's not talking about embracing all and being the religious thing and doing the religious thing. He's talking about reflecting the nature and the heart of God himself. We are called to be a holy people. That's what we're here to do. Always remember that. Now, he's ready to tell us the third thing that you've got to always remember. Never forget. Never forget. Or we won't be the people. We won't make the decisions that God calls us to make. So here's what he says. We're going to read. Just read verses 3 through 5. All right. First Peter chapter 1. Here's what he says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we talked about that last week. We talked about worship. And we talked about praise. And the role that that plays in God's economy. Even since Old Testament days. God conquers kingdoms through worship. So it's no light thing what we do here. right? It's no small thing what happens here in this room. Praise be to God, he says. And fa praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? He says, because I'm getting ready to tell you. I'm getting ready to say why well, I'm going to stand back and say praise be to God. It's because of what God's given us. It's because of what God has done. Always remember what you have. Always remember what God has given you and what it is that's at stake. So he says this. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade, kept in heaven for you, you who, you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Praise be to God. My Lord is exactly right. Praise be to God who in His great mercy. I want to tell you right now. Right, that is the most powerful description of God that I can even imagine. And I want to tell you, that's where I live and where I have lived for the last several years of my life. I want to tell you right now. It's because of the great mercy of God that I even preach. I'm thankful that God is a God of justice, and I'm thankful that God is a God of goodness, and I'm thankful that God is a God that creates, and I'm thankful that He's a God that sustains, and I'm grateful for His power beyond what I'm able to imagine. But what really stirs my soul is His mercy. What really stirs me and brings me and calls me and compels me is His mercy. And the only way to describe His mercy is it's great. Because that's why we're here today, right? I want to tell you that's why I preach. If it wasn't for His mercy, I wouldn't preach. In fact, if it wasn't for His mercy, I don't know where I'd be. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth. Now look, y'all. Some of you have been around the block a time or two here. You know what that's talking about. New birth is one of the New Testament's favorite ways to describe conversion. 
One of his favorite ways to describe what it looks like to come to God. And I want to tell you what, that's powerful. I like what Paul said in Colossians chapter 1. He said, we've been translated out of darkness into light. And I get that, you know, but it leaves me kind of, you know, new birth. He has given us new birth. That's what stirs my soul because how many times have you looked at your day in front of you and wished like everything you could just back out? How many times have you looked and said, I've made a mess of this? I have absolutely blown this. If I could just hit, what is that? Hit the delete button. How about that? Erase clear history. How would that be? Just clear it all. I want to tell you because you just, if I just hadn't said that, if I just hadn't done that, I mean, how great would that be? Let me tell you what. What he's talking about here is a new start, a second chance, another opportunity, and yet those phrases don't even capture it. The only way to really capture what God has given us in His great mercy is just to describe it this way. We're born again. Born again. That's the way. Now, some of us are thinking here right now, uh, yeah, he's talking about baptism, and we automatically run there. And I'm not saying that's a wrong thing. Because baptism is connected with that new birth and all that sort of stuff. But if you focus on that, you've already, you've already missed the point of what he's talking about here. He's telling us in his great mercy, folks, he has birthed us into a whole new family. Regardless of what we've done, regardless of where we've been, we are new creatures. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Or 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If anybody's in Jesus, what? He is brand new. Old has gone away. When are we going to finally kind of get a hold of that? And let me tell you what. You want to really have something to impact the way you live? Let that fill your soul. We've been, God, by His great mercy, has given us a new birth. Man, that's incredible stuff. Incredible stuff. That's why when Nicodemus walks up to Jesus in the opening chapters of John, and he says, ah... Eh, yeah, we know you're something because nobody could be doing the things that you're doing unless he comes from God. And Jesus says, Nicodemus, let's just cut to the chase. You cannot take what I'm talking about and stick it into some kind of religious mold. This is not about religion. It's not about being religious. This is about being born again of water and the Spirit. You know what Paul did? Paul took that message, this new birth idea, and he preached it so powerfully and he preached it so strongly that the religious folks began to say, you can't be talking like that. You start talking like that, people will think it's okay to live any way they want to, that God's grace is going to take care of it because they're all been brand new. You can't do that. And Paul says in chapter 6, starting in verse 1, you think that I think that you can live any way you want to? He said in Greek, it's meganoito. It means, may it never be, absolutely, teetotally, I want to tell you right now, absolutely not. Uh-uh. No, you can't. He said, don't you realize that as many of us have been baptized into Jesus, we've been baptized into his death and raised to a new life. New life. In his great mercy, he has given us brand new life. A new birth. And as a result of that new birth, there are two things that you have. The word into is found twice in verses 3, 4, and 5. It's a word, three little letters in Greek, ace, E-I-S. You've been born into, you've been born for the purpose of. Here it is, number one, look at verse 3. Born at a new birth, we've been born into a living hope. You can put your hope in any old thing, y'all. And you know what the thing is about hope? Hope is a feeling word. I mean, it's not a word, I, mean, I understand all, you know, the dynamics and all that kind of stuff, but it's a word that you feel. We know what it means to feel hope, and everybody in here knows what it means to feel hopeless, don't we? Which one do you like? Which one sustains you? Which one breathes life into you? Hope. Now, you can hope in lots of stuff, but there's only one hope for living, breathing human beings that can sustain us, and that is a living, breathing hope. Because anything you put your hope in down here is going to get burned up in a fire. There's only one hope that you can trust in. It's a hope that's been ushered in by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's the perspective where we stand. That's the perspective that changes everything. The tomb is empty. The only reason I haven't sold everything I have and moved to Margaritaville for whatever reason is the tomb is empty. Nobody's in there. And I know absolutely for sure this is not the end. 
This is the beginning, right? This is the beginning. That's what this is. A living hope. Hope is what you <laughs> need. Hope changes everything. It's like the little guy playing baseball. Little league, top of the first half. The opposing team is up first. They score 18 runs, y'all. 18 runs. Finally, that third out mercifully comes. He's running back in, and somebody up in the stands, he's been out in left field. Somebody up in the stands says, hey, man, this game looks like it's already over. He said, over? He said, we hadn't even got up to bat yet. Man, I love that. Oh, y'all, come on. Do you see the little guy? Can you hear him? Hope changes everything. You've heard me say this before. I'm going to say it again. I can live about 40 days without food. At least that's what I've been told. I've never tried that. I can live about four days without water. Never tried that. I can live about four minutes without air. Never tried that. But I'm going tell you something I have tried. And I can tell you out of experience, this is right. I can't live four seconds without hope. When you lose hope, everything changes. You don't know what happened up in Chicago 17 days ago, right? That basketball court in that little old neighborhood up there. It ushered Chicago back into the crime limelight, limelight once again. September the 19th, 10.15 in the evening, a guy walks up. A bunch of folks are playing basketball there. And he walks up and he shoots 16 rounds. You remember that? 17 days ago? Shoots 16 rounds. 13 people are wounded. What a little three-year-old boy, De Deontis is his name. Shot him right in the face. As that story developed, I don't know if you've been keeping up with it or not, but you know what it developed? They, investigators determined that there were a certain number of people on that basketball court that knew exactly who it was. And nobody as of yet has come forward to identify the perpetrator. Why? Why would you think? Let's get interactive here. Why would you think? Fear, fear, fear. But let me tell you. Fear is the first by byproduct of losing hope. When people lose hope, there's nothing left to live for. They don't think anything's going to change and nothing happens. Fear is the first product of living a hopeless life. Absolutely it is. Lewis Smedes has written a book and he talks about in that book a friend of his who is the executive director of an AIDS clinic in a county hospital. And one day there was a guy there being treated, a young man being treated for AIDS. He'd been being treated there for a while. And his doctor was not there that day, but it was another doctor who did not have the bedside manner, really, of his doctor that he normally sees. And this doctor, as he's leaving, this doctor looks at him and says pretty casually, pretty cruelly, he says, you know, don't you, that you're not going to live to see the end of the year. But crush this little old boy. And he comes out crying and he stops at this friend of Lewis Smee's, this is the executive director, stops at her desk and he says, that man in there, that man in there stole my hope. And she leaned back and she said, well, he probably did. Then she leans forward and she says to him, what you need is a new hope. A living hope. A hope that is verified, a hope that is evidenced by an empty tomb. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. you know that song? Prove it! Let's stand up. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Holy Father, thank you. Thank you that you have birthed us into a living hope. A hope that will sustain us no matter what. We find ourselves crushed, perplexed, undone, almost at every corner. But Father, we move on because of you, what you have done through Jesus. Thank you for that empty tomb. May we never become complacent about that. May we never act as if that doesn't really matter. 
thank you, Father, for what you give us. In Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen, Amen, y'all. Sit down. Somebody says, Mark, you're too optimistic. That's your problem. You're optimistic. I've lived life long enough to know. I'm going to tell you what, you can't be that optimistic. Let me tell you something, y'all. I am not an optimistic person. I'm not necessarily a pessimistic person either. Those things both depend upon what's going on around you. Optimism is not big enough for these britches. Okay? Let me tell you what. I am in bondage to. I am chained by. I am imprisoned by a living hope. There are lots of bad people in this world. There's lots of bad things that can happen in this world. You know what their destiny is? Every last one of them, they're going to dust. But the tomb that I'm looking at is empty. Living hope. He says, always remember that. Don't forget that. Here you've got a lot of junk coming up, but don't forget that. You'll make the wrong decisions if you do. And then here's the second thing he says, never forget. Look at verse 5. Never forget that you have an inheritance. Will not perish, will not fade. Nothing's going to happen to it. It's going to be eternal, by the way. An inheritance is the legacy that a daddy leaves behind to his kids. And he gives it to his kids not because they've earned it. Not because they deserve it. He gives it to them because that's his babies. And it's already ours. Notice what he says. Kept in heaven for you. By God's power. Through your faith. It's kept. Now, I want you to hang on just for a second. Because sometimes it sounds a lot like pie in the sky by and by. You ever heard that phrase? This is not just pie in the sky by and by. This is a perspective. This is a reality that we live in, and it impacts everything that we do. Now, let's back up just a second and take a little excursus on life here, y'all. Life is hard. Life is hard. And God is not necessarily, His job description is not to make it easy. And if you think that's what it's all about, you're going to be totally, highly disappointed. Now hang on here. Nobody escapes the harsh realities of life. Just ask Leonard Barris. That's right, you can't. Because we buried him last week. Ask Libby Mickey. Ask Curtis Turner that went to bed one night. And really kind of woke up about 10 days later with all kinds of things going on. And then add to that the possibility that you could be persecuted out of your mind. Because of what you believe about Jesus. Is that rough? Ask Jesus how rough that is. Ask the Apostle Paul how rough that is. Ask Peter who wrote this book. Well, what do you do with that then? What do you do? What is the, is is there a value here? How do I, listen, you could choose to let all that stuff that goes on in life to crater you. You could allow that to take you down the tubes and get bitter and get angry at God and all that other kind of stuff. But where are you going to, where are you going to wind up then? You take your faith and you cash it in. Where do you wind up then? You ever heard of Christopher Hitchens? Anybody? He's an atheist who has uh, traveled about the country over the last several years, touting atheism, challenging, taking on all comers. He's noted for his candor and his clarity. But in 2010, he was diagnosed with cancer. And he writes something about that. He writes an article about it. And I want you to just hear what he says. Now, he doesn't believe in any of the stuff that we're talking about. He says, I am badly oppressed by a gnawing sense of waste. I had real plans for my next decade and felt I'd worked hard enough to earn it. Will I really not live to see my children married, to watch the World Trade Center rise again? And to the dumb question, why me? The cosmos barely bothers to return the reply. Why not you? I sometimes wish I were suffering in a good cause or risking my life for the good of others instead of just being a gravely endangered patient. Allow me to inform you, though, that when you sit in a room with a set of other finalists and kindly people bring a huge transparent bag of poison to plant into your arm, that's his description of chemotherapy, 
And you either read or don't read a book while the venom sack gradually empties into your system. He says, I'll tell you how I feel. You feel swamped with passivity and impotence, dissolving in powerlessness like a lump of sugar in water. Christopher Hutchins is dead. And that's what he looked to. I wonder, Leonard, is that your perspective? What in Leonard's perspective? I wonder about Danny Murphy. Is that your perspective, Danny? You know what Danny told me the day he went in the first time for all that? He said, bring it on, smiling from ear to ear. Where do you get that? Where do you get that? If this is not real and it doesn't impact, I want to, ta- I want to ask you, where does it come from, y'all? Where does it come from? So here's what, here's what Peter says. He says, oh yeah. He says, back to verse 5 again, we're shielded by God's power through faith until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. You rejoice because of that living hope. <laughs> And because of that eternal inheritance, oh yeah, you greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. Now look, as the book develops, he goes on to talk about especially, particularly, suffering for your faith, persecution for that. Okay? But right here, as he begins to introduce that subject in this introductory remarks, here's what he says. He says, all kinds of trials. From cancer to loss of a loved one, to a hangnail, to persecution. What does he say? You greatly rejoice, y'all, in all this stuff. Because here's what's the real, here's the real reality. Even though for a little while, you've got to suffer. Uh, yeah, but why? Really? Well, that's his, answer. that's his question and issue in verse 7. Lots of answers to this question. Why is there suffering? Why do good people suffer? Peter deals with one, he deals with more than one in the book, but here's all he deals with at first, and this is the main idea. These have come, these trials have come, so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire. And he's talking about back in, those, back in the day how they would refine gold through fire, burning out the impurities. And you know how it is. Gold, it's either 10 karat gold or 14 karat or 24 karat or whatever it might be, depending upon how much fire and how much refining. The fire in his imagery here are those trials. You don't act like it's not real. You don't act like it doesn't hurt. Well, of course it hurts. It's fire. But it serves a purpose. A purpose for your faith. Your faith which is greater and more valuable than gold. What does it do? It proves genuine your faith. So that it may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Look, you can ask all day, Did God, does God allow this stuff to happen? And you may not get very far. You may get really frustrated. Does God cause all this stuff to happen? Sometimes people ask that. Those are really not the question. Here's the issue. God uses it. And there's nothing that happens to you, nothing that befalls you that is without a redemptive purpose. To folks like Christopher Hitchens, it's all of no use. What's the point in any of it? I want to tell you there's lots of point. Where does it come from? That's not the issue. God uses all of it. And nothing happens to you that doesn't have a purpose. I can put up with anything as long as I know there's a point. As long as I know that it's, there's a reason for that. I mean, imagine, what if you could just peel back the crystal, peel back the veil of invisibility for a moment and look at what all that heaven is and look at all that God has for us, all that's in store and somehow embrace it. Or you could really see that and experience that joy and all that that comes about as a result of it. And then you come back here. What would life be like? How much joy and how much exuberance would you have for, for life? I want to tell you, even the worst thing that may happen to you, it'd be like a, a millionaire suffering the loss of a penny or less than that, a scratch on a penny. What if you had a crystal ball? Let me tell you. Oh, that's right. We got something better than a crystal ball. We got the revealed Word of God by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Peter. And he says, don't forget what you have. Always remember what you have. We can forget that sometimes. And I want to tell you what, it leads to trouble. Does it? Yeah, yeah. It does. Philip Yancey, 
is in a small group. He's got a friend of his that's in that group who's a Christian leader. Some of you might recognize his name if I were to say it. I'm not going to say it because I don't know it. But he says this guy was having troubles, troubles, troubles with his adult kids. They were in trouble. Laying awake at night, worrying about it, worrying about it. Paying out the wazoo for legal fees. And on top of all that, he was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. So they're going through all this together in this group. And one night they get together and this guy says to all of them, he says, I don't have a question about God's goodness. My question is, what is he good for? And he starts wailing. Well, they're all out there saying this thing and that thing and another thing. And he bats it all down. He slaps it all down as if it's not anything. And a little bit later on, Yancey comes across a quote by Dallas Willard. And this story sticks with me because it's one of my favorite quotes from Dallas Willard. He stand, came across this quote and he sent it to the guy and says, Is God good for his promise? Here's what he says. For those who love God, nothing irredeemable can happen to you. Dallas Willard didn't think of that on his own. That's First Peter 1. There is a purpose to everything. God uses it. Is that the only explanation for this kind of... No. But it's right where He dwells. For those that love God, nothing irredeemable, irredeemable can happen to you. So Peter writes in verse 8, Though you've not seen Him, you love Him. You have to pause here. Let the air come back in the room. The main thing about your relationship with God is not how well you know this or know that. It's not about religion, y'all. It's about a relationship. <laughs> Ooh, I love the warmth of this. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Peter had seen Him, but these folks had not. And that's where you and I are just like them. We've not seen Him either. Do you love Him? Though you, though, though, though you have not seen Him, you love Him. There's a warmth of connection in that. And even though you don't see Him now, you believe in Him and you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know what I think? The world of Christendom is divided all kinds of ways. This denomination and that denomination. I'll tell you, that's not the big division. Not in my mind. Not anymore. It's not a division between fundamentalists and, and, and charismatics. It's not a division between conservatives and liberal. It's not a division between Republican Christians and Democrat Christians and all that kind of... Ugh. The real division, the real separation are those that are aware and those that are unaware. When you have been touched by the love of Jesus and you in turn can reach and touch others with that, what does he say is the result? An inexpressible joy. There's a measure. Now, joy didn't come from that love. You know what that love does? When you connect with that love, you know what you are? You're grateful. You're absolutely grateful. Gratitude fills your soul. Gratitude doesn't come from joy. Joy comes from gratitude. Oh, even though we hadn't seen him. We love him. And in gratitude, an inexpressible and glorious joy begins to transpose our life. Never forget. Always remember who you are, huh? what you're here for, and what you have. Can we serve you in any way? Let us know about it.